are made in the image of God. We don't look like him, but we act just like him. And that's how leadership evolves is from the foundation of true character. Because if you don't have that, you are not qualified to lead anybody anywhere without character. So we're going to continue on values and character. And here's some leadership principles. It is about leadership is about personal development. So you must take leadership of your own life. The most important principles of leadership, and we all know this, you have to have a purpose. You have to know why am I here, what am I doing? If you are a leader, there's a lot of leaders out there that don't even know who they are, what they're doing, and they're leading people nowhere. And remember Jesus says, he says it's like the blind leading the blind, and they lead them into a ditch. And a ditch is, is like a dead end, but you're still alive, right? <laughs> and miserable and going nowhere. And you can only go as far as your leaders go. So watch who you are following, right? Or who's mentoring you, because you can only go as far as they go. So always judge the leader according to the character. Don't be impressed by a leader's gifts. Everyone has gifts. And we're going to go into that a little bit. But look at their fruit. That's more important. Are they cultivating their fruit? So we have to have a sense of destiny. We have to have passion, which is personal motivation. Now these are the characteristics of a leader. Now I'm going to preface a little bit. Everyone's called to be a leader, but most people die as followers. We've talked about that many, many, many times. Because we have the mindset that if you're a leader, you have to look a certain way, you have to be from a certain um, ethnic group, you have to be a certain gender. You know, in our, in our society, it's the white males are the leaders. Well, according to Jesus' philosophy, anyone and everyone is called to be a leader. But what makes you a leader? It's your gift and serving your gift. But character is more important than your gift. So you have a sense of purpose, you have a sense of passion, and a true leader will have principles, a commitment to values, no matter the cost no matter the stakes. And a true leader has to have a vision. If you do not have a vision, you are not qualified to be a leader. Because you yourself are going nowhere, and you're asking people to follow you nowhere. I remember um, there was, I was once under this one pastor, and I'd be like, what's your vision? Where are we going? And he'd be like, um, I don't know. And every few months, I'd ask him that. And I wouldn't go up, and I didn't have a bad attitude, like, what's your vision? Where are we going? It wasn't like that. He'd come to me, we'd have a conversation. I'd be like, well, where are you seeing your church going, whether it was the worship or whether it was a leadership or what? I don't. I said, well, you have to have a vision. You have to have clarity, because then where are you going? And where are you bringing the people? I don't know. And so nothing's really evolved and they're still kind of the same agenda, just kind of going through the motions. But a leader will always have a vision. This is where I'm going. Character and leadership. And we talked about character is like a fixed statue. No matter what time of day, day or night, the storms in life, what's going on, that statue is fixed. We showed the Statue of Liberty last week. No matter when you go by her, if there's birds on her, pooping on her, it doesn't matter. She's just standing there. Whatever happens, she is fixed. Remember we showed the picture of Sandy coming in the storm. She's still standing there. So no matter what things we go through in life, you are fixed. You are like a statue. The quality that is unchanging, it's stable and dependable. If you think of people in your lives, and maybe sometimes our parents, or teachers or different people that have influenced us, were they stable? Were they fixed? And that's one thing I can, thankfully, my dad, no matter what, Matthew's kind of the same way, not a whole lot shakes him up. <laughs> and that's good, because sometimes a whole lot, uh, just a little bit, will shake me up. We had someone here with a lot of discre discrepancies this weekend, and I found $26,000 in discrepancies, and I was shaken up. 
is this person intentionally stealing? Is this person not? And I'm just, uh, and I start getting tight. I start getting, okay, what's going on? Do I terminate them? Do I not? And we have decisions to make, all right? She's gifted, she's a great employee, but does her fruit line up to the gifts? Should I keep her on staff? You know, I need to find out. I need to do some research and investigation. But you have to, no matter what, you are dependable, you are stable, no matter what happens. And that's, when, that's why I think it's important that the males, too, are very stable. Because sometimes us women, okay, this going on, this person said this, what's going on? And we get hurt or offended. And the husband were like, listen, it's okay. They're just being that way. Let them be them. It's not about you. Don't take it personally, honey, right? <laughs> it happens. No, no, never. <laughs> Where did you get that from? <laughs> Good morning, guys. <laughs> come on in. There's some seats here in the front if you wow, guys want to come up wrong. here. Hi, How Lily. Hi. <laughs> the boys want to sit in the back. Oh, I don't know where they're going. So, anyway, that's one of the qualities I really admire about Matthew is not a whole lot ruffles his feathers. So I can go to him, okay, what's the deal with this? Because he can give me his opinion and it's not all emotional. <laughs> so anyway, a true leader has to be dependable, has to be stable and unchanging when things are changing all around us all the time. Now remember, this year is the year of change. So you have to be ready for it, up in here, in our mind. Prepare for the change. So here's the paradox about character. You should be always growing, but never changing. That's the paradox. We're always growing, we're always learning from the experiences, we're always learning from change, but yet you remain stable. You remain true to your principles, you remain true to your values. You remain true to yourself. So people who are unstable, unpredictable, lack character. Have you guys ever known a person that will just fly off on the handle with just crazy things that are nothing sometimes and you're afraid to tell them anything? Because they're just nuts. They're lacking that stability. Are you guys going? Little kitties? Lily? So, character and leadership. Here's a few facts. The credibility of a leader is his or her character. That's what gives you credibility. The force of leadership is character. It's your ability to lead. That's what gives you credibility. It's your ability to influence. If you violate people's trust, you can no longer influence them. Trust is a big part of leadership. You have to earn people's trust. And once you have um, violated their trust, it can take 20, 30 years for people to trust you again. And that's why adultery is so crucial. You may never earn their trust back. And adultery, the word adultery means treason. It means uh, you violated a commitment. You've committed treason. That's what that word means. You made a commitment and you violate it. You are a traitor. That's what that word means. So here, that's why in the church, we see people that happens to, or even in the government, we see these crazy politicians and they're running around. People don't trust them because in their personal life, they're not trustworthy. How do we know their character is the same in the office? What are they doing? Shifty deals on the side. What's going on? So the trust of leadership is character. Trust is the true is currency of leadership. And that's very important. That's why even in the households, when the parents say something, they need to be honest and stick to their word because then they're stable. And that gives you credibility. If they don't trust you, they will undermine you and do not abuse your trust. So that's why it's very important. That's why, you know, as long as I've been here, you have to set the standard. <coughs> All right, when we get overpaid on things, all right, they bring me the check. 
well, you need to send that back. That's not our money. If we were to take, even though the check's written out to us, that doesn't belong to us. That's not really our money. Send it back. And you set the example so they know. If people come to you and say, hey, you want in on this deal? There's a side deal we're doing. Then they already know that you lack character if they come to you in the first place thinking you'll do shady things. But people are like, oh, I'm never going to Vaughn. I know he's straight up and he'd never consider doing something shifty. They don't even come to you. But people all around us are doing things all the time. So the legitimacy of leadership is character. The integrity of leadership is character. And we talked about integrity as being one with yourself. Above thine own self, be true. Let your thoughts, your actions be true to your values. So influence through leadership. How do we influence people? That's what leadership is all about, not manipulation. Once you start manipulating people, you are a witch. That is witchcraft. But with leadership, the higher in leadership you are, the more meetings you have. And that's how you influence people. Jesus was always meeting with people. Now I look at meetings a lot differently. I hate meetings. <laughs> But you can always learn things in the meetings, and you can always influence. Remember there was this one, uh, I think it was last year, there was this one meeting my husband had with somebody who was a little cuckoo, and we weren't sure about him. He was all into numbers. He'd be like, what's your name, Matthew? Matthew, what's your last name, your middle name? And then he'd add up the numbers, and he'd be like, yeah. And he'd be like, OK, so based on this, you're a good person to work with. And he would, in his emails, He'd be like, Trista, your, your name means this, so I know you're a person of integrity. And I'd be like, what? Like, that's not normal to always qualify people according to the numbers of their names or their birth dates. You know, it's a whole numerology thing here. Now, there is, you know, the Bible is based on 7, 12, 24. You know, God, there are certain numbers that are three, very important, and mean a great deal. But you don't base decisions <laughs> and who you're going to do business with off of numbers. And I remember one time he said to Matthew, he says, well, we never know when, when God is coming, when Jesus is coming back. And Matthew's like, oh, I know when he's coming back. I don't know the day, but I know the season. And it'll be when the gospel of the kingdom is taught into the whole world, then he's coming back. And he's like, oh. And he was a very religious man, but a little cuckoo. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps in the meeting, you know, with Matthew, there are sometimes you can plant seeds with people. And even with the Collier commissioners, I mean, that's just great influence. And then at City Hall, that's going to be great influence also. Okay, here we go. The best interpretation for leadership is not skill, it's not academics, and it's not experience. People can have all of that but lack moral force. The spirit of character is what's to be pursued. And that's not, we don't teach that. If you to go get your degree in leadership, which there is, they don't teach you about character. They don't teach you how important that is. But that's the number one driving force and foundation of a true leader is character. So here's the importance of values. Leadership is the capacity to convert vision into reality. And that's where we set goals. And that's where we go forward. They stand for something on something. When I wrote my vision, also in the steps, you have to write your code of ethics. You have to say, I will not lie. I will not do this. I will be a person of my word. My yes is yes, my no means no. So you are standing on something, value. You must stand on a set of values. Values regulate and motivate personal and corporate action. So for instance, when I'm in my staff meetings and something comes up, I'm always thinking about principles and values. I don't even have to think about it. It's just instinct because it's who you are. It's ingrained in you whether you're going to lie or not. And some people are just liars and they believe their own lies. You know people like that. And they believe what they're saying and you just know, OK, I saw you go right and they know I went left and they believe it. And how do you deal with people like that? You know, I'm dealing with a family member now. OK, I had to demote you. You're not going to be in this department anymore because what you're saying to us doesn't line up with what the guests are saying you're saying to them. And that's my own family. Come on. Are you kidding me? 
or I'm going to put you out at the marina where you can't lie or do anything like that, and you go wash some boats. <laughs> but you have to teach them how important that is. So values regulate and motivate personal and corporate action and conduct. And it starts with the little things. And remember the principle in the kingdom, if you can't manage and be a good steward and manage over the little, little and do things ethically, he won't give you more. You will never grow, you never go, for, go forward, and your vision will never come into reality if you can't even ma the manage. If I can't manage when I'm teaching and meeting with you guys on vision and preparing for my Sundays and managing this, what we're doing here, then how can we influence more people? It's not possible. It just won't. And sometimes that's why some churches never grow because the pastors can't manage what they have and there will never be growth. That's just a principle. That's just, that's just how it works. So without values, leadership is destiny without discipline. Vision is protected and interpreted through values. It's the best way to show one, show one vision. Because, you know, people are watching what you do, not what you say. They watch. People know. Especially the youth. They're not stupid. Right, Brittany? You guys know what's up, right? <laughs> No matter how great your dreams are, you'll never make it if your values don't coincide. So I can talk about vision for two years standing up here and living it and meeting with you guys, but if your values and your character does not line up with who you are and you have integrity, your vision will go nowhere and you will be a joke. You will be, nobody will take you seriously. Leadership without values is power without principles. And again, we go back to God gave us character before power. So let's look at some people in the Bible. We had Samson. He loved to work out. He loved to flex his muscles. And a woman winked at him, and he was weak in character. Now let's look at Joseph. Joseph worked on character, and a woman winked, and he ran. Two very gifted men. And they were both called to leadership. All of us are called, but they were had specific um, gifts that God gave them and a path for their life, but according to their character, they either was to their own demise or they ended right or they ended strong. So Samson had strength of body. That was his talent. That was his gift. But Joseph had strength of character. Samson impressed men. Joseph impressed God. Samson's talent, therefore, was taken from him. He did not end well. Remember? They put coals and burned his eyes. He had no vision. He couldn't see. Joseph was promoted because of his character. Samson died in a position of weakness, and Joseph died in a position of power. <coughs> it's very clear how important character is. And both were tested in the same way by a woman. We will all be tested. And don't you think, us talking about character and values, we all won't be tested soon for it. Values, here's the definition. It's a person's principles or standard of behavior. One's judgment of what is important in life. Now, if money is the first thing after you pursue, when you get a overpayment of a check, you will put that in your bank account. I'll never forget the IRS sent us, uh, they sent us, uh, it was an overpayment. It was, I, we didn't know what it was, but the IRS sent us, it was $11,000 or something. Yeah, it was last year. And we could have taken that money. We didn't know what it was for. Why are they sending it? We don't know. We thought, ooh, what's this for? This is a down payment on our land. Then we called and found out they had processed the money rather than in 2011. They had typed it in their system 2001. So it went to our taxes that were submitted to that. So they said, oh, you overpaid us for 2001, $11,000. And we didn't put it together. That, that was what we had sent them for an estimated tax payment on the business. So they said, well, that's our money. We could have easily deposited it and, oh, this is our payment. Well, we found out this wasn't the down payment for our house. This was the IRS's money, and we had to send it back. So values are belief or conviction. 
It's standards or ideas that regulate your conduct. So you have to know what your value system is. You have to know what's important in life. They are personal philosophy. And your kids are watching. And this is how kids learn, by watching their parents and how they operate and how they operate with other people in business and how they operate with their friends. Values produce ethics, moral standards, and values that affects your behavior. So values and character equals your behavior and how you conduct yourself. So people are watching this. They don't ask you, what are your values? Hey, Vaughn, are you a liar? No, they watch you. Does Vaughn tell it like it is? Values are better than rules. Rules are a sign of, of non-instilled values. Values send a message. Values shape individuals and societies. Values are not private. They become culture. They attract like values. So if you have a bunch of people hanging around you that are shifty, that already tells me what your value system is. Birds of a feather flock together. Check out who you're attracting, and that can reveal your set of values. Yes, Alex? Can you differentiate between values and moral standards? Uh, moral standards and values that affect behavior. Values are better than rules. Uh, that, that's about rules. Values produce ethics, moral standards, and values that affect behavior. Philosophy is your belief system. Remember we talked about that, I think it was three weeks ago. We talked about values, morals, ethics, philosophy, and that produces culture and a community. All of those things. And they all come from your belief system. So it's very important who we vote in the Supreme Court. Because they are producing a culture based on their value systems. Leadership establishes a code of ethics. Leadership must esteem morals and values and standards over Comfort. That's rare to find that in leadership, especially in our government. Leaders live by a set of principles, not by expediency. The only way people can believe you is when you live out your values. So let people, you have to earn people's trust. For instance, when I was talking, remember I told you guys a few weeks ago that priest out of Norway. He was Lutheran 20 years. He's done. I want out of religion. I'm done. But I don't know what other options I have. And I said, oh, let me tell you all about this kingdom. Okay? He, uh, where, was I, where was I going with that? I can't remember. I was up a few times last night with the baby. <laughs> what was I saying? He was done. He wanted out. I can't remember. Where is going with that? When you live out your values. Food is more important than gift. We all know that. We've talked about that. In the church, we admire people for their gift. Oh, you heal, or your gift of healing heals many. Well, don't be so gullible. Gullible is when you swallow anything anyone says to you. Check them out. Check out their fruits. What's going on in their real life? How's their marriage? Do their kids, do they have a good relationship with their kids? We can tell you some stories. Power versus character and values. Character and values always wins. Gifts are given without working for it. You were born with your gift, but fruit, you have to bear for yourself. You have to work on the fruit. Nobody can do that for you. You have to work on the patience, you have to work on love, kindness, gentleness. Right? Nobody does that for you. So don't run after people with gifts. Check their fruit. Don't be gullible. Self-control is a fruit, not a gift. Fruits have to do with character, not with your gift. Your gift is easy, and you can run with your gift, and people will follow you. But more importantly, what is your fruit? And that's what we're supposed to judge them by. What is their fruit? Not judge them by their gifts. Nowhere will you see that. What's their fruit? And against the fruit, there is no law. So seek greatness for yourself, but seek it to serve. But work on your character. Work on your values, your ethics. Where do you stand? What? What's that? This is what they need to be taught. 
The kids? Yeah. I'll send you this one too. Yeah. I knew you'd want it. <laughs> yes, because all the kids, they know their gifts. That's easy. Melissa sent me a nice little slide how the youth finds their gift. And that's easy. What about character? And you guys talk about Tiger Woods, uh, not Lance, it's not Lance Armstrong. Michael Jordan now. <laughs> I went and changed all my slides <laughs> before I sent them to you last week. Boy, I did a bad job last week with those men. <laughs> so seek greatness not for yourself, but seek it to serve. How is character manifested? It's when your values, your morals, and standards are tested. And that's the key word. We will never know your character and what you stand for until you're tested. We didn't know Samson and Joseph's character until they were both tested. And then it came out. And that's a lot of times when we see, when the temptations that people fall into, then we see what they're made of. Then we see, okay, Joseph had to run with his coat torn off of him out the door because this woman was all over him. But Samson, Delilah bats her eyes. Did you guys see that on the Bible story? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but he gave in. Like that, it was nothing. Character. So no one can help you. Oh, let's go to number two. Leaders need to stop going after their power and skills, rather develop their character. Because that's what gives you longevity. That's again what holds the weight of the vision. If you want to end well, then focus on your character. No one can help you with your character. Remember Peter, he said to Jesus, I will never deny you. If people come to kill you, I will stand up for you. So he's saying, I'm there for you. And then Jesus, listen, what you have just said will be tested. And not even I can help you. The adversary is going to come and test you. And there's nothing I can do about it. So Jesus himself can't help you with your character. He says, I pray your faith will not fail. Nobody can help you with your character. That's on you, bearing your own fruit. So when self-sacrifice self becomes more important than popular compromise. Secret to character development, trust. It's a product of stability through tests over time. When we had that incident with the employee this weekend, she'd been here six months, and I said, that's fine. You, you, you work on your love with her. You're going to judge her through, uh, through the eyes of love. That's fine. But people have to earn my trust. Let people earn. You have to let them earn it. You earn it. You don't just automatically believe what everybody says. Don't be gullible. Test comes to develop trust. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Sufferings are tests and challenges. Because we know that sufferings produce what? What does the test produce? Perseverance and character. That's a very important trait to have. Don't be a character. Have character. <laughs> a kingdom leader must be fixed, stable, and unmovable. People can believe what you say. They can trust you. If I say I'm going to do something, I will do it. If I say, no, I can't, or no, I'm not interested, and no, I'm not. You can believe that. Oh, I know what I was telling the priest. After an hour and a half of teaching him the kingdom, he had his Bible, so I had him look up the scripture for himself so he could discover it himself. So what did, what did Satan tempt Jesus with up on the mount, up on the hill? He showed him all the kingdoms of this world, and I will give them to you. How could the devil do that? He's, I said, look it up for yourself. Read that. He discovered it himself. And then at the end of persuading him or just showing him the kingdom, and I said, but don't believe anything I said. You find it for yourself. You don't have to believe me. I haven't earned your trust. You've only known me for a few days. But study yourself. That's what I told him. You don't believe me. Don't believe just because I say it. It's in the Bible. Learn it yourself. Character is developed by testing your commitments, testing your loyalty, testing your dedication, testing your faithfulness, testing your honesty through pressure, demands, temptations, and resolve. 
That's how character is developed. You don't know what you're really made of until the temptation and the tests come, and they will come. It is absolutely um, final that they will come. Absolute. They're guaranteed, especially after we're talking about this. <laughs> don't think I don't know that. Especially if I'm teaching it, I'm looking out for the tests and temptations. Character tested by pressure. We didn't know what kind of character Joseph and Samson had until they were tested. Samson lost his vision. Your vision can be destroyed by defective character. You can fall up. I can do a whole teaching on how to fall up because we don't see that done a lot. We see people fail and they don't know how to fall up. Who's the guy, uh, the bicyclist I keep talking about? Lance Armstrong. It is Lance Armstrong. I don't know who I'm thinking of in space. Who's the other Armstrong? Neil. Neil. Yeah. Thank you. I was getting them confused. I kept thinking it was I was talking. <laughs> So anyway, his vision is done. All he wants to do is bike. His passion is biking. He wants to be number one in biking. There's nothing wrong with being number one in your field. You're having dominion and you're having fun. But his lack of character, he gave in and cheated. And now he's known as a doper. And any time you see him for the next 40 years of his life, that's the guy that was a good doper. He was the best doper rather than the best cyclist. What a legacy. And his kids, how do you tell your kids? Man, I'm a good doper, kids. I shouldn't have done it. He's struggling coming to terms that he really did it, that he really deceived himself. Wow. He should have said, listen, I did it, I was wrong. Or have somebody speak for him. Yes. He's admitted to it. He's ashamed. And, you know, that's the first step. Samson lost his vision. He didn't end well. But God's purpose was fulfilled. You see how that happened? He still killed Philistines and all these people. But man, he ended pretty bad. 1 Timothy 3.1 If anyone seeks to be great, a bishop, an overseer, he desires a good thing. So again, greatness is in our DNA. But he must be above reproach. And we talked about that last week. That means someone who says, Oh, Vaughn did this on the side. No, and they come and tell me that. I'd be like, I don't think that's Vaughn's character. I'm going to do my research. But you know what? That doesn't sound like Vaughn because he should live above reproach. That means nobody should believe the gossip about him. He should be faithful to his wife, temperate, respectable, hospitable, good teachers. Don't be a drunkard, not violent, be gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. There are some leaders I know in a religious organization in Norway. And they're on TV. They went on the X Factor over there in Norway. And they represent Christianity. The leaders have a problem with alcohol. The leaders don't respect their wives. And when you get drunk, sometimes you do things. And I'm like, OK, everyone has issues. You need to step down from leadership, deal with your issues, get your house in order, get yourself in order, then you can represent our kingdom. Because you can be redeemed. There is a good way. There's a right way to be redeemed. There's a right way. But we don't even talk about that. We kind of shoo them, put them away. Oh, they sinned. Remember with the big Jimmy Stewart? Swagger, swagger. swagger thank you. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> Stewart, wow. <laughs> That's the opposite end of the extremes. <laughs> there. <laughs> I can't wait till I start sleeping through the night again. Okay. Never trust or fear a person who doesn't fear God. You guys hear that? Do they fear God? I hear stories. Where is their fear of God? These are men in the ministry, women in the ministry, people in leadership that should fear God. What? I hear stories. What? How can you sleep at night? Where is your fear of God? That's what I want to know. That's what I ask all the time. And listen, there's a lot of people in the ministry. Don't be gullible. Don't be gullible. <laughs> Watch their fruit, not their gift. Never trust 
or fear a person who doesn't fear God. That's key. If that's all you remember, it's worth it today. When Israel wanted a king, they needed to choose someone who feared God. A leader needs, here's the qualifications to be a leader, spiritual qualifications, intellectual qualifications, able to teach others what he knows, physical qualifications, emotional qualifications, no quarreling, stable, domestic qualifications, other home in order. This is a privilege to lead, not a right. Because remember, teachers are held to higher standard. They're held to higher standard. Process of temptation. All right, we're going to finish on this. To temper means to test for weakness. Okay, that's where the word temptation comes from, temper. Testing you for any weaknesses. And then and only then will you know what you're made out of when you face that temptation. It's a process of removing weak spots out of something. Process of removing defects in your character. It's the process of strengthening in order to trust you with a call on your life. And when you are faced with fiery trials, rejoice and accept them as friends. It's building you, it's creating you, it's making you capable of the vision. Because remember, the process of vision is more important than the end result. Process of Joseph's life, being trustworthy, was more important because then he finished well. Now I'm going to show you. Um, everyone knows the Roman Empire. They were the strongest empire that there ever was. And one of the main reasons for their strength was their weapons, long swords, and the strongest swords that anyone made. So they could cut off, it said, they could cut off three heads with one swipe of the sword. They could cut through the armor of their adversaries. That's how strong and powerful their swords are. So if you look at the process of forging a knife or a sword, it's called tempering, to temper a sword. That's where the word temptation comes from, to temper, to test for weakness. So when you have a sword, and this is what the Roman Empire did, you had the blacksmiths that made the swords. And what they did was they would take the iron ore and they would shape the swords, hit it against the, the anvils, and then they'd put it in the fire to make it strong, right? Then they'd take it out of the fire, and according to what they saw, these black spots, the colored spots, were the weak areas of the sword. So then they'd hit, it, hit, hit those areas, pound them, pound them, pound them, and then put them in the cold water and it would solidify the molecules. And then they'd take it out, and they'd put it in the fire again. And then they'd pull it out of the fire, and they'd look for any black spots. Those are the weak places. So then they would temper, temper, hit, 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 bang, bang, bang those areas, and then put it in the cold water to make it stronger in those areas. They'd pull it out, put it in the fire again. That process is called tempering, to test for weaknesses. This is why the Roman Empire was so powerful. Then the blacksmith that did the tempering had to write, engrave his name on the sword, and he had a contract with the government. If his sword was defective, they would take his life. So the livelihood of the blacksmith was based on the tempering process of getting all the weak spots out of the sword. Get it? So get ready. Cold water. Eee, this isn't fun. Up in the heat. Ah, this hurts. Out. Bang, 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 bang. Up. Look in the water. It's a process. Yes, Alex? I've done some tempering in the machine shop. It's also important maybe to say that the extreme heat also dissolves or melts off the impurities. If you heat metal enough, it will turn into a liquid and everything else can float off. You loose it and blow it off. Mm-hmm. Very good, very good. So, kingdom people, it's important we go through this process. Important. What's the scripture say? 
when you are faced with fiery trials, challenges, tests, temptation, rejoice and accept them as friends. They are making you stronger. They are getting the weak areas out of your life. They are removing the defects, the impurities out of your life. But you'll never know what you're made of until you're tested. It's like Samson and Joseph. Then we'll see what you're really made out of. And remember, sometimes you'll have to sacrifice your comfort for it. Process of tempering with a sword. So leadership is a privilege given by the followers. Earn their trust. Violation of character forfeits the privilege to use and serve your gifts. People will automatically not trust you. Character forfeits the privilege for you to use your gift. Lance Armstrong forfeited his privilege, and he cannot use his gifts. He can ride his bike, but man, he can't race. He can't be number one. That's in our DNA to be great, to have dominion in our field. It disqualified him. Character protects power. Very important. We all want that power. That's a promise. I will give you power. You have dominion, but character protects it, and it protects your vision. Character is more important than vision. It's more important than power. These are things we love teaching and talking about and operating in, but it will be to not if you don't develop character. And again, grow, but yet be the same. So teach the kids how important their gifts are, which we are on Saturday, but how more important character is. And I can touch on that too in the potential area. I wonder if most of them know Joseph and Samson. Maybe I'll take pictures. Because the, the, they're into muscles and working out. And then I'll talk about Joseph on the throne, ruling Egypt. You know what's funny? Both people accomplished God's purpose mm -hmm. either way. Mm -hmm. 